This is the Chapter 8 video lecture, The Quantum Mechanical Model of the Atom. Here we're going to take a look at characteristics of light, and we'll see how light and electrons can act as particles and waves. And then we'll see how these behaviors would determine the energy levels and even the orientations of electron orbitals in an atom. Before the development of quantum mechanics, scientists believed that everything was deterministic. So no randomness. If we had a mathematical function, if we put in one input, then we're going to get one specific output. So if we just take a look at this function here, if x is equal to 3, then you know that y is equal to 7. But as time went on, uh, scientists found out, especially with subatomic particles, uh, what you see isn't always what you get in the future. Uh, so y might not always equal 7 in the eyes of quantum mechanics. Uncertainty and randomness are important concepts in quantum mechanics. This is going to sound strange, especially when we need observations and evidence to strengthen the theory. But quantum mechanics helps us understand why the elements in the periodic table are arranged that they are. Also, if you take a look at certain elements in the periodic table, some of them are more reactive than others. Take, for example, the noble gases. Most likely, they're not going to react with any other elements or other materials. But if you go to the other side of the periodic table with the alkali metals, if you throw those metals in a beaker of water, you're going to observe very exothermic reactions. So we need quantum mechanics to explain those things that we observe. For us to understand uncertainty and particle nature and wave nature, we have to understand the story of Schrodinger's cat. So here we have a box with a lid that's closed and inside we have radioactive material, a flask with some poison, and Schrodinger's cat. Now, inside the box, the radioactive material is going to decay. The products of that decay will hit a detector, which is attached to a hammer. If enough products are detected, then the hammer will fall. And it's going to fall hard enough so that it'll break the flask containing the poison. Now, what is going to happen with Schrodinger's cat? If we open up the box, then we can see if Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead we can make that observation once we open up that box. But if we keep the box closed, we don't know what's happening inside it. We don't know if the radioactive material actually decayed. And if it did, we don't know if it was detected. And if it did, we don't know if the hammer fell. And if it did, we don't know if it broke the flask. So if the box remains closed, we cannot make any observations. So we have to say that the cat is alive and dead at the same time. So this idea is like saying that light is behaving as a particle and as a wave at the same time. So this is going to be problematic when observing electrons because they are extremely small. Shining a light on electrons would affect its behavior. So if you want to think of it this way, 
uh, imagine that you have a handheld flashlight and you are shining that light onto a humpback whale. Well, most likely that whale is not going to notice you. It's not going to notice the lights. It's just going to keep swimming along, eating krill, and just not pay attention to you at all. Now, what happens if you take that same flashlight and shine the light onto a New York City rat? Well, its behavior is definitely going to change. It'll probably stop scurrying across the subway platform. It might run away from you. It might come at you. But its behavior will change when you shine the light on it. So now what happens when you have something much smaller than that? What happens when you have an electron? Well, later on in, in the chapter, we're going to take a look at uh, an experiment called the photoelectric effect. And we're going to see how electrons behave when we shine light onto those electrons. Again, understanding the quantum mechanical model is very important in chemistry because uh, we need to use this model to explain why metals uh, conduct electricity when nonmetals can't. We're going to see that um, in a couple of chapters from now. Also, we're going to understand why certain elements bond the way that they do. Again, thinking of noble gases. Why is it that they don't really want to bond to anything else? But we have uh, diatomic halogens like Cl2, F2. The first thing that we're going to look at is light as a wave. And if we do that, then we need to know that it is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So um, it has an electric component and a magnetic component. And as light moves across space, those two components, the electric and magnetic fields, they move perpendicular to each other. Also, um, because it's moving through space, we need to know the speed of that light. So in a vacuum, you must know that the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This is not an exact number. Uh, we're just going by three significant digits, so be mindful of that when you're doing your calculations. This is what I mean by mutually uh, perpendicular to each other. The electric field is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. So even if you rotate one of those fields, like let's say um, like 45 degrees, the other field will also rotate 45 degrees so that they stay mutually perpendicular to each other. This picture just gives you an idea of how fast the speed of light is. Um, so uh, if you're ever caught uh, in a thunderstorm, um, you could actually tell how far away that storm is. Once you see lightning, start counting off in seconds until you hear the thunder. Now for every five seconds, that represents every mile the uh, storm is away from you. Okay, it, it, because the speed of sound is much uh, slower than light, it's going to take a while for that thundering sound to reach your ears. The first wave characteristic that we're going to look at is amplitude, and that's just the height of the wave. And you can measure it two different ways, either node to crest or node to trough. This horizontal line right here, that is the node. Nothing happens at the node. If you want to give it a numerical value, that value will be zero. So if you want to measure the amplitude of the wave, you're just going to go from node 
to crest or node to trough. They will be the same value, okay? It's, it's just distance. Now, if you change the amplitude of the wave, and if we're gonna consider light wave, then you're gonna change the intensity of that light. So if we're gonna make the amplitude larger, then the lights will end up being brighter. Now, instead of lights, let's say that we're dealing with sound waves. If you increase the amplitude of a sound wave, how is that sound going to change? Well, now that sound is going to be louder. The next characteristic is wavelength, and that's represented by the Greek letter lambda. And that is just the distance between one crest to the next crest, or one trough to the next trough. Um, so here, if, if we're just dealing with uh, visible light, and we change the wavelength, then we're gonna change the color of that light. Now let's switch it up to sound waves. Let's say that I make um, uh, the wavelength of a sound wave smaller. So we have our first hump here, our first crest, but then our second crest happens at a much shorter uh, distance, a shorter wavelength. What's going to happen to that sound if we decrease the wavelength? Well, now the pitch of that sound is going to be higher. Okay, it's going to be the same loudness because we're not changing the amplitude, but the pitch of that sound is going to change. And in this case, it's going to be higher when we decrease the wavelength. Now we have to introduce energy and frequency to waves. So pretend that you're at a, um, at a rock concert and you're standing right next to the speaker. Well, the amplitude of those sound waves, they're going to be very large. And if they're large enough, you'll probably get blown away by those sound waves. So there's a lot of energy coming out of those speakers. Also, um, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but for me, if there's sound that's very high pitched, uh, then it really just hurts my ears. If it's low pitched and it's loud, well, my ears don't, they don't hurt at all, but I, I definitely feel the sound waves hitting my body. So that's something that you need to take note of in terms of light. If the frequency is high, in other words, like um, for sound, like it'll hurt your ears. If the frequency is high, then the energy will also be high. Now this leads into our uh, third characteristic, frequency. It's represented by the Greek letter nu, N-U. Okay, this is not a V. Don't get confused because later on in the chapter, we are going to encounter an equation that actually has V as a variable. This is not V. Okay, so frequency is the number of waves that pass a certain point in a given time. Okay, so here in this picture, you could see how wavelength and frequency are related to each other. If we lengthen the wavelength, we're also going to lower its frequency and vice versa. Remember from the last slide, if we have high frequency, then we're also going to have high energy. Um, another thing you have to take note here is uh, the unit for frequency uh, can be anything. It could be um, inverse any time unit. But for the most part in this chapter, we're going to use inverse seconds. So it can be depicted as s to the negative 1 or 1 over s. If you see this unit, hertz, that is specifically 
for inverse seconds. Okay, so don't forget that. Frequency technically can be any unit time, but the inverse of it. So it could be inverse seconds, inverse minutes, inverse years. But if you see hertz, that is specifically inverse seconds. Okay, so this I mentioned already. Um, if you change the wavelength of a wave, you're also changing its frequency. They are inversely proportional to each other. Now, they're related to each other based on um, the speed of light, which is represented by the letter C. That's our constant. Okay, so if you increase the frequency, you're going to have to lower the wavelength so that our speed of light constant stays the same. Let's try out our first problem uh, dealing with the frequency, wavelength, and the speed of light. Here we need to calculate the wavelength in nanometers of the red light emitted by a barcode scanner that has a frequency of 4.62 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. So go ahead and pause this video, take a few moments, work this out yourselves, and when you're ready for the answer and the work, click play. Okay, so we have our equation from the previous slide. We just have to rearrange it a bit so that we solve for wavelength. You need to make sure that you're in the correct units because again, speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So our frequency is in the in the correct unit. We have inverse second. So um, s to the negative one. Um, here, th this might look a little bit confusing to you, but th pretend that there's a, a one here. This slash is the um, fraction bar. Okay, so we have we have one over s as our unit. Our s units cancel out, and please do not forget the conversion factor between. Uh, nanometers and meters. You'll be using that a lot in this chapter. So our answer here is 649 uh, nanometers. Here's another problem for you to try. We have a laser that emits green light with a wavelength of 515 nanometers. What is the frequency of the light? So please press pause, work it out. When you're ready for the calculations and the answer, click play. Okay, so again, our units uh, match up, so we could just plug in our values into the equation. And the frequency of that green light is 5.83 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. I mentioned the color spectrum earlier, and hopefully everyone knows the acronym ROYGBIV. Uh, if you don't, please memorize it. It'll help you uh, remember the colors in order of increasing frequency. And you could tell the color of light by its wavelength or frequency. Um, for the most part, it is easier to memorize in terms of wavelength, uh, but frequency works just as well. Uh, taking a look at uh, the images here on the slide, um, here we go. We have our nice Pink Floyd uh, prism here. You could see white light coming into the prism from one side and then leaving the prism as Roy G. Biv. This should tell you that white light is a mixture of all the colors in the spectrum, in the visible spectrum. Okay. Here in the bottom picture, this is 
showing you that if you have an object that's red in color, then all the wavelengths of light are being absorbed by that pigment, that red pigment, except for red light. So the reason why we see this shirt as red is because red light is being reflected and going into your eyes. Now, if you see uh, an object that's colored white, that means that none of the uh, wavelengths of light, of colored light, are being absorbed. All those colors, Roy G. Biv, are being reflected back to your eyes so that it looks white. Now think about what happens with black objects. That means all the colors in the visible light spectrum are being absorbed. So no wavelengths are being reflected back to your eyes. This is a very nice picture showing different wavelengths, frequencies, and amplitudes, and uh, what the effects are in terms of light waves. So again, if you change the wavelength, you also change the frequency. So if we just take a look at the visible light spectrum, Roy G. Biv, this top one right here, we could say that this is red light because out of the three, it has the longest wavelength. If we decrease that wavelength or increase the frequency, same thing, then we're going to move closer and closer to the blue side of that visible light spectrum. Now, if you change the amplitude, but keep the wavelength the same, so here we have green light, we have green light. If we increase the amplitude, then we're increasing the brightness of that green light. So here, let's pretend that there are five runners, red, orange, green, blue, and purple, and they're in a foot race. They need to get um, from the starting line to the finish line. And right off the bat, I would say that these are very poor runners because they're just uh, zigzagging all over the place instead of just going in a straight line. Okay. The shortest path between two points is a straight line. So already here, I like I I see that I wouldn't want these people on my team because they're just they're just going all over the place. So let's say that these five runners run at the same speed. Which one is gonna take the longest time to get to the finish line? Well, it's going to be this purple runner because he's zigzagging a lot more compared to, let's say, the red runner. Okay, the blue runner has to cover more distance. So, again, if everyone is running at the same speed, then the purple runner is going to take the longest to get to the finish line because of his longer path. Now, let's say all five runners have to reach the finish line at the same time. Which one needs to have the most energy to get to the finish line um, the same time as everyone else? Well, again, it's going to have to be the purple runner because he has, um, he has the, the longest distance to cover. Okay, so he needs to run the fastest. He has to have the most energy to just to catch up with the red runner. So just like with the colors in the visible spectrum, the purple light is going to be um, the most energetic. It's also going to have the highest frequency out of all the colors. All right, so we have question 8.1. Which statement best describes the differences between a bright green laser and a dim red laser? Please press pause. Take some time to read through all three choices. Reason it all out. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. 
Okay, so our answer is letter C. Uh, the two lasers emit light of different frequencies. That should make sense because we see two different colors, green and red. And uh, then the lights from the green laser has a greater amplitude. Again, that should make sense because the green laser is brighter than the dim red laser. So far, we've only looked at visible light, which is a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Regardless of what type of radiation we look at, the relationships between wavelength, frequency, and energy are the same. So let's take a look at infrared light versus ultraviolet light. Infrared light has a longer wavelength and thus um, lower energy compared to ultraviolet light. Now what happens when you step outside of your house and it's a nice, bright, sunny day? Well, hopefully you put on sunscreen before you stepped outside because you need to protect your skin from the high energy ultraviolet radiation that's coming from the sun. Now let's take a look at infrared light. Uh, well, that's the type of radiation that comes out of your remote controls uh, when you're scanning something at the um, grocery store and use the bar scanner that uses infrared light. You don't have to worry about wearing sunscreen or any type of protection like that um, when being exposed to infrared light because it is less energetic compared to ultraviolet light. Here is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, if you just take a look at uh, the center here with the gray arrows, with the radio, microwave, infrared, you need to memorize uh, these different radiations. You need to memorize the order. Okay, again, radio, um, they're the lowest in energy, highest in wavelength. Gamma rays, high in energy, low in wavelength. Okay, um, another thing you have to take a look at is here is the visible light. It's the smallest group in the bunch. Okay, what they did here is they enlarged this small portion of the spectrum so that you could see the wavelengths for each of the colors. Notice the units, we're in nanometers here, but if you look at the uh, other radiation, so if we go back to radio, okay, with radio waves, it can range anywhere between 10 to the fifth, and I guess maybe, yeah, let's just say 10 to the negative one meters. Okay, so the wavelength unit here in this part of the picture is in meters, but this enlarged portion is in nanometers. Okay, I've had students that just took a look at red, they saw 750, and they added 10 to the fifth meters um, with that. And uh, so they, they got a very simple question wrong when it, when it asked for the wavelength of red light. Okay, so there are several things here. You need to remember the order of the different radiations in the spectrum. You need to memorize the wavelengths of, of um, Roy G. Biv. You also need to understand the relationships between wavelength, frequency, and energy. Here's our Pink Floyd prism again. We have white light coming in from the left-hand side. It's getting broken up as it's going through the prism and even leaving the prism. Uh, and we could see that white light is made up of Roy G. Biv. This shows how infrared light is used to detect uh, any objects that contain a certain amount of heat. Here we could see one type of cancer therapy, uh, radiation therapy with, with high energy radiation, 
uh, that's used just to focus on and destroy cancerous cells instead of, you know, like taking medicine and potentially destroying the cancerous cells and healthy cells. Okay, so we have three different types of radiation, visible, x-ray, and infrared. Write these three in order of increasing wavelength. So that means that the, the last thing that you're going to write, the, the last radiation in your list that you're going to write is going to have the longest wavelength. So take a moment, write it out yourselves first. Press pause, write it out yourselves first. Then take a look at the answer choices and uh, pick your choice. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, the answer is A. So if we're writing this in order of increasing wavelength, again, that means that the last thing on the list is gonna have the longest wavelength, but it's also going to have um, a smaller frequency and smaller amounts of energy. Okay, so that means x-ray really should be written first. Um, think about going to the dentist. Um, you know, depending on your insurance, I guess, uh, you probably get x-rays once a year. Well, every time you get an x-ray, they always need to put that lead smock over you just to minimize the exposure of the x-rays, okay? With infrared, you know, if you use your uh, remote control, you could point that thing at yourself and press all the buttons, nothing is gonna happen to you because the amount of energy in the infrared light is not as high as in the x-rays. All right, so we know a little bit more about waves. We know their characteristics. We actually know an equation that um, relates wavelength and frequency. Now what happens when these waves interact with each other? Well, the results will depend on how in phase these waves will be. Okay, so if these waves are in phase with each other, then we're gonna have what's called constructive interference. Our product wave is gonna have a larger amplitude. If they're out of phase, then we're gonna have destructive interference. So our resulting wave is going to have a smaller amplitude. Here we have a very nice picture of constructive and destructive interference. Here we have um, two waves that are in phase with each other. Okay, so pretend that there's a node going across here and another node going across here. We could see that it's um, the same wavelength, same frequency, and even the same amplitude. Okay, they're in phase with each other because the crest of the top wave is lined up with the crest of the bottom wave. So that means everything else is lined up. Now, when these two interfere with each other, then we're gonna have a resulting wave that has a double amplitude. Okay, the wavelength is still gonna be the same, so that means the, the frequency is still gonna be the same, okay? Um, if you wanna think of it this way, pretend that you have two um, red light waves Okay, the resulting wave is still going to be red, but it's going to be brighter. It's going to be a brighter red light. Okay, so that's constructive interference. Destructive interference, in this case, we're going to have two waves that are completely out of phase with each other. So again, just like the top one, um, the wavelengths of both of these waves are the same and the amplitudes are the same. It's just that the crest of this top wave meets up with the trough of the other wave. So then what's gonna happen? 
we're going to have um, a wave, a resulting wave that's just a node. It got canceled out. Again, if you want to give this a numerical value, you have zero. Or um, another way of thinking it is you have a dark spot here. There is no light. With constructive interference in this example, you have a bright spot. So we saw waves interacting with each other. What happens when, an, when a wave encounters an obstacle? Well, that's where we have diffraction. Those waves have to bend around the obstacle. Or if there's an opening, they have to bend so that it could go through um, an opening in that barrier. And this only works, you, you'll only see this with waves. Particles don't diffract, they don't bend. Uh, later on, we're going to see what happens to waves when there are two slits in a barrier. We're going to have what's called an interference pattern. And again, this is only this can only be seen when light acts as a wave and not as a particle. Okay, so we have uh, two different illustrations here. We could pretend that we have um, a light source here that acts like a wave and a light source that acts like a particle. In both pictures, we have a barrier with a slit. Regarding the wave, it needed to diffract in order to get through that slit. With a particle though, um, you know, if, if it hits the barrier, then it hits the barrier. But if it could go through the slits, then it's just going to keep traveling through. Now, this is what happens when there are two slits in the barrier. We would have what's called an interference pattern or a diffraction pattern. And again, this can only uh, be observed if light acts as a wave. Okay, so here's our source of light. Um, our wave is propagating through space and it encounters the barrier. Well, some of those waves, like they're, they're gonna diffract as it hits uh, both slits. Then it's almost gonna be like um, that there are two new sources of light. Now what's gonna happen with these two new sources of light? Well, now the waves, can interfere with each other. And that's what's happening here, this alternating of light spots and dark spots. Well, the dark spots are, um, are where waves are out of phase. So we have a node. Remember, nothing happens at a node. You're at numerical zero there. At the white spot, that's when we have waves that are in phase. So we have constructive interference. Okay, so please remember when you see um, white, uh, light spots and dark spots alternating, you have a diffraction pattern and that only happens if your source is acting like a wave. Now let's take a look at light acting like a particle. And for us to do that, we need to take a look at the photoelectric effect. So this is where we're going to shine light onto a piece of metal and see how many electrons get emitted from that metal. So according to classical wave theory, more electrons should be emitted if um, the light wave's intensity is increased. So the amplitude of that wave would be increased. And that should make sense because if we increase the amplitude, then we're going to increase the energy of the wave. Think back to um, our rock concert example. If you're standing right by the speaker and uh, the sound gets louder and louder, well, the amplitude of those sound waves are getting larger and larger. And if, if they get large enough, you probably would be blown away from the sound wave. So there's a lot of energy coming out of those speakers. 
Another thing based on this theory is that even if you shine dim light onto that piece of metal, eventually electrons would be emitted. And they call this time between shining light onto the metal and electrons being emitted, they call that lag time. It'll take some time for energy to build up so that electrons can uh, become emitted. Okay. Another way of thinking that is, let's say uh, that you're super hungry and you're eating a bag of potato chips. You're eating the potato chips one chip at a time and eventually you won't be hungry anymore. So this is the basic setup of the photoelectric effect. Here's our piece of metal. Light is gonna hit this piece of metal. And if there's enough energy, then electrons are gonna be emitted. They're gonna hit this positive terminal. And you can see that this whole thing is uh, connected to a circuit. Okay, and we can tell uh, how much electrons are being emitted based on uh, the current meter that's attached to the circuit. Okay, so here are the experimental observations of the photoelectric effect. And right away we see some problems. So taking a look at this graph here, um, let's just say that we're only looking at the visible spectrum. Okay, and the frequency of light is increasing going from left to right. So if we're gonna label this with, with our colors, uh, red is gonna be on the left-hand side, and we're gonna keep going to violet on the right-hand side. Okay, so that should make sense. The frequency of light is gonna increase from left to right. Okay, so when we look at the rate of electron ejection on the left-hand side, we could see that colors like red and orange don't emit any electrons at all, okay? Even if um, bright red light or bright orange light are shown onto the metal, no electrons would be ejected. But now let's move on to, let's say, yellow light. We'll say that right here we have yellow light Okay, now right away, we have electrons being ejected from that piece of metal. So this tells us that there is a threshold frequency. There's a certain frequency of light that electrons will absorb so that they could be emitted from the metal. Okay, so in our example here, our, our cutoff, our, our threshold is yellow light. Now, if we increase the intensity of that yellow light, well, then we're gonna have a higher rate of electron ejection. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is lag time. There is no lag time here. Once the right frequency of light was shown onto the metal, then electrons were ejected instantaneously. That's like saying you, you were really hungry again, you have your bag of potato chips, you take one chip, you eat one potato chip, and automatically you're not hungry anymore. Again, this is where we're seeing light acting like a particle instead of a wave. So Einstein uh, was explaining this um, phenomenon uh, by using photons or quanta. And these photons are just specific packets of energy, okay? Um, we already know that energy is uh, proportional to frequency. We're now going to learn two different equations. They, they are very similar. The only difference is we're uh, switching out frequency with uh, the speed of light divided by lambda, okay? This was the first equation that, that we learned. Frequency equals speed of light divided by lambda. We're just doing a little substitution here. Okay, this H is called Planck's constant. Make sure that you know the constant. Okay, 
and we can see the relationships here again like what we've been seeing before energy is directly proportional to frequency energy is also inversely proportional to wavelength what you need to remember is that when you're uh, using this equation and you're calculating energy this is the energy for just one photon this is the energy for just one photon when you come across uh, different math problems where you have to use uh, one of these two equations uh, you the question might uh, mention like a burst of lights or an uh, uh, a laser beam well that burst of light won't have one photon it'll probably have moles of photons so you have to be careful with your units here this is the energy for one photon or joules per photon okay so here is our math problem we have a nitrogen gas laser pulse that has a wavelength of 337 nanometers it contains 3.83 millijoules of energy how many photons does this contain okay so again uh, we're, we're dealing with a pulse a laser pulse it has many photons in it we have to figure out how many photons there are okay and just like with any math problem make sure you write out your givens uh, write out whatever your unknowns are so here we're trying to figure out uh, the number of photons uh, we're going to use the energy equation with Planck's constant okay and we're going to use this relationship here to figure out how many photons there are in that laser pulse we already have this e pulse from uh, our problem just remember that it's in millijoules so there's gonna there's gonna be some conversions uh, that you have to do okay and this equation right here is the energy for just one photon and that's going to be our denominator okay so here's the work our wavelength was given in nanometers we have to convert it to meters then we're going to use the energy equation with Planck's constant okay all our units cancel out except for joules which is what we want in the end we got to convert the 3.83 millijoules to joules so that when we divide out our two energy values we get the number of photons in that laser pulse okay so if you want to be a little bit more complete with the units back up here this should say joules per photon and so here in the denominator it would say joules per photon so that our final unit would just be photons Uh, here's another problem we have a hundred watt light bulb that radiates energy at a rate of 100 joules per second if all the light emitted has a wavelength of 525 nanometers how many photons are emitted per second okay so um, here we, we have a new unit uh, to look at but again this this really is just a unit conversion okay think back to your techniques in uh, chemistry 101 or 103 try this out yourself uh, press pause and uh, when you're ready for the calculations and the answer click play okay so here here's our equation again with Planck's constant we plug in our values notice here that I did not put the wavelength in scientific notation we don't have to do that there's a little shortcut that you could use 
I know um, one nanometer is 10 to the negative nine meters, so I just plug that in. Like this is not my final answer, so I could um, uh, have it the way that I want it, just to save time. And this is the um, energy for just one photon. Okay, so now I uh, use the 10 joules per second as my conversion factor. So here I'm going to have to use the reciprocal so that photon is on top and that seconds is on the bottom. That's our desired unit. How many photons are emitted per second? So we need photons per second. Okay, so on the bottom, we have 3.786 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Divide all that out so that we get 2.64 times 10 to the 20 photons per second. Here's our last problem in the group. Uh, the energy required to dislodge electrons from sodium metal via the photoelectric effect is uh, 275 kilojoules per mole. What wavelength in nanometers of light has sufficient energy per photon to dislodge an electron from the surface of sodium? Okay, so uh, press pause. Take some time to work this out yourselves. Don't just jump ahead for the answer. Uh, when you're ready for everything, click play. Okay, so we're going to need the energy per photon. We're just taking a look at one photon. How much energy does that one photon have? Okay, so uh, what we're given here uh, the 275 kilojoules per mole, that is our, uh, one of our conversion factors, okay? Um, with the kilojoules, we're going to have to convert to joules. And since we want a singular photon, we're going to need Avogadro's number to convert from moles to photons. Now we're going to use uh, this energy value in our uh, Planck's constant energy equation. But this time, instead of frequency, we're going to be using uh, the one with wavelength. But don't forget the C. Don't forget our speed of light constant. OK? So then uh, we plug everything in. Don't forget to convert to nanometers, because it wants nanometers. We have 435 nanometers as our answer. Going back to our photoelectric effect example, we were shining yellow light onto a piece of metal, and that's where we saw electrons being ejected. So the energy of that photon was just enough to emit electrons. That energy is called binding energy, and it's represented by this Greek letter phi, P-H-I. Now what happens if we shine blue light instead of yellow light. Okay, what's going on with the blue light? It's got a shorter wavelength compared to yellow. That means it has a higher fre frequency and thus higher energy. So there's more than enough energy to unbind these electrons from the metal. Okay, but what's going to happen to the extra energy? Well, all that extra energy gets converted to kinetic energy. So if you're going to shine light that has a shorter wavelength or a higher frequency, however you want to say it, there's more than enough energy to unbind the electron, and the excess energy would be converted to kinetic energy for the electron. Let's take a look at this question here. We have three different wavelengths. 325, 455, and 632 nanometers. Uh, these wavelengths of light are going to shine onto a metal surface. And three different observations were noted. Observation A, 
no photoelectrons were observed. B, photoelectrons with kinetic energy of 155 kilojoules per mole were observed. C, photoelectrons with kinetic energy of 51 kilojoules per mole were observed. Now, which one, which observation corresponds to the 325 nanometers of light? Take a moment to fully understand this problem. Uh, so you're going to have to pause, pick your choice, and when you're ready for the answer and the explanation, click play. So observation B goes along with the 325 nanometers. Okay, so if you're, if you're ever given a list of wavelengths, always put them in order. You could put it in whatever order you want. Let's just keep it like this. We could see that the wavelengths are increasing as they're being listed, right? So if wavelength is increasing going from left to right, that means frequency and energy is decreasing going from left to right. So our most energetic wavelength is the 325 nanometers. Okay, so if this is the most energetic. In, in the photoelectric effect, we're expecting uh, electrons with leftover energy. Okay, That's, that'll be our most extreme scenario. For, um, electrons with the most uh, kinetic energy. So that would correspond to observation B. Okay, so let's switch this around. What, uh, which observation corresponds to the 632 nanometers? Well, this is the one with the least amount of energy. So again, thinking extremes, uh, we're probably going to say, all right, no electrons were being emitted at all. And so that would be letter A. Okay, so this is where you have to um, arrange the different types of electromagnetic radiation. Here we have visible light, x-rays, and microwaves. You have to arrange them in order of increasing wavelength, then frequency, then energy per photon. So please pause this video, um, make your arrangements for the three different uh, parts, and then press play when you're ready for the answers. Okay, so for letter A, um, we're gonna write down x-rays first, then visible light, then microwaves. Okay, this is for increasing wavelength. Okay, so now with frequency, it's just the other way around. Okay, remember they are inversely proportional to each other. So we're going to write microwaves first, then visible, then x-rays. Then moving on to letter C, where we're dealing with energy. Energy is directly proportional to frequency. So our arrangement for C is going to be the same as in B. Here you're going to be doing the same thing, but this time with green, red, and blue lights. So please press pause to make your arrangements for the three different parts. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, here we go. And um, if, if you needed to, uh, use the image that's on the slide, then that's fine. But eventually you're going to have to memorize this entire electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so for a wavelength, you start off with blue, green, and red with the largest or the, the longest wavelength. Uh, with wavelength and frequency being inversely proportional to each other, you're just going to switch up the order for letter B. 
And since frequency and energy are directly proportional to each other, the arrangement for C is going to be the same for B. Okay, now, uh, since we have this picture up, let's, let's take a look at uh, the visible light spectrum. This is what we call a continuous spectrum. This is a continuous spectrum. You cannot give me a specific wavelength where um, orange ends and yellow begins. Same thing for where green ends and where blue begins. There's no way for you to, to tell me that. Like, I don't know, maybe you'll say here it's um, 510 nanometers. A classmate might say, no, it looks more like 505. Okay, there is no a discrete wavelength where one color begins and another ends. This is a continuous spectrum. Now, when you observe fireworks or neon lights, you're actually observing emission spectra. Those types of spectra are non-continuous. You could actually figure out what wavelengths you're seeing because they are um, specific colors of light that are being emitted okay now these type of spectra they can be used to identify materials um, if you were in lab um, you could I like actually burn um, small pieces of metal over a Bunsen burner and you could see the color change and use those observations to identify the metal that you have Here are some examples of emission spectra. Okay, here with hydrogen, you could see that it is a red color, but if you uh, take this red light that's being emitted and put it through a prism, you're actually going to see that it's made up of many different wavelengths that'll produce a red color. So remember the Pink Floyd um, prism where we had white light coming from one side and then it gets split up into Roy G. Biv? Well here, uh, we're taking the light that's being emitted from a hydrogen lamp. We're gonna say it's like the, you know, a coral pink color. We put that through the prism and we could actually see that it's made up of, in this case, four different wavelengths. This is an emission spectrum. This type of spectrum is non-continuous. You could actually give me what these, uh, what these wavelengths of light are. These are very nice pictures of the flame tests. Um, again, the, the colors that you would see here is just a compila compilation of many different wavelengths. Uh, so yeah, here with lithium, you see like a nice like red orange, but it could be a combination of many different wavelengths, many different discrete wavelengths. This just shows the uh, just a, a comparison between continuous a continuous spectrum and non-continuous spectrum. Okay, again with white lights uh, broken up into very G Biv you can't tell me where one color ends and another begins. But with emission spectra, you can tell me what wavelength of light this is for helium. Like, yeah, you know, you know it's yellow, you could also give me that specific wavelength. Okay, so here we have two different spectra for mercury. One of them is emission. The other is absorption. So go ahead and pause this video, figure out which one is which, and then press play when you're ready for the answer. Okay, so the top one is emission. The bottom one is absorption. If you weren't too sure, just, just think about that slide that had 
uh, the girl with the red shirt in the beginning of the video, okay? We were able to see her shirt as red because all those other colors in Roy G. Biv, they were being absorbed except for red. So the red light is bouncing off of her shirt and going into our eyes. That's why we see red. Now, why is it that we see black? Well, all the Roy G. Biv colors are being absorbed so that no colors would bounce into our eyes. That's why we see black. So uh, the bottom spectrum here for Mercury, that is absorption. The top one is emission. So there's this scientist uh, named Rydberg who is trying to figure out um, how hydrogen can emit certain wavelengths of light. So he was able to come up with this equation here uh, with a constant, but it only predicts wavelength for hydrogen. It doesn't work with anything else. So his equation uh, shows how to get those wavelengths. It doesn't say why we get those wavelengths. It also doesn't explain why atoms are even stable to begin with. So we're going to have to take a look at uh, the nuclear model, uh, specifically uh, Rutherford's nuclear model, to try to understand why certain uh, atomic spectra give specific discrete lines in their emission spectra. Just a little bit of a review. The nucleus is very dense and it's found in the center of the atom. Okay, the volume of the atom is small. The volume of the nucleus is even smaller. Uh, most of the mass of the atom is found in the nucleus uh, because we have uh, neutrons um, that don't have any charge and protons that are positively charged. Um, and what's uh, orbiting around the nucleus are the electrons which are negatively charged and extremely light compared to the masses of protons and neutrons. Okay, and so most of the atom is considered empty space. Here are some issues with Rutherford's model though. Um, we know that opposite charges attract. They would, they'd come together because they're attracted to each other. Okay, now electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, and they are very close together. So why is it that they don't just come together? Why don't they just bind in the atom? How is it that they are able to stay separated? So th there's something missing in Rutherford's model. This is where Niels Bohr comes in with his model of the atom. He's saying that the electrons can stay where they are in the atom because the energy is quantized. Think back to what Einstein was saying with quanta or with photons. There are specific packets of energy involved here with uh, Bohr's model of the atom, okay? That's why electrons don't just collapse towards um, the nucleus. There's a certain amount of energy holding the electrons where they are in the atom, okay? All right, so now why do I have the $7 bill on this slide? Okay, so let's say that um, it's a hot summer day i'm the only one that's selling um, nice ice cool bottled water but i'm selling it for ten dollars a bottle okay you you've got money but what i need from you in order for you to get uh, my bottle of water i'm gonna need a seven dollar bill you can't give me a $5 bill and two singles. You cannot give me seven singles. You cannot give me 28 quarters, okay? Think of, think of the photoelectric effect. The, the frequency um, 
in terms of like the money that you're giving me is not high enough. My threshold is the $7 bill. Because of those specific packets of energy, because of those quantized uh, energy, electrons are going to be at a fixed distance from the nucleus. Okay, so the, the energy of the electron is going to be proportional to uh, the distance, its distance from the nucleus. Now in terms of emission spectra, the reason why we see those specific wavelengths of light in emission spectra is because electrons would emit radiation as they jump down to a lower energy level. Okay, a photon of light is going to be emitted and that energy of the, the energy of the photon is going to be related to the distance between the two energy levels. Here is a very nice picture of the Bohr model and uh, here we have three electrons, three electrons jumping down to a lower energy level, so in this case n equals 2, okay, and we could see the relationship between uh, the distance the electron jumps and the wavelength of light that's being emitted. So let's take a look at this electron over here. It started off with um, at n equals 5 and it jumps down to 2. So here we have a certain distance that it traveled. Okay, A certain amount of energy was released in the form of a photon. Okay, And the color of that photon is violet. All right, if we're sticking with uh, the visible spectrum, we already know that violet is going to have the highest energy. Okay, now let's take a look at the other side with red. This electron started off at n equals 3, jumped down to 2. This distance is much shorter, so the amount of energy released is smaller. And so because of that, it's going to release a longer wavelength of light. So this make this picture should make sense um, with with this electron specifically. Uh, the photon of light that's being emitted is going to appear red because it has a smaller amount of energy compared to the violet. So we have the photoelectric effect. Uh, with light acting as a particle. Now we're looking at a principle called the wave particle duality of light. And here the behavior of that light, the behavior that we see, depends on the experiment that we have set up. Okay, so here um, I have uh, on the slide a paintball gun. Maybe some of you have gone paintballing before, uh, but the idea is you're going to just take this gun that has uh, tiny balls covered in, in paint and uh, you're going to shoot other people with it. Okay, that's, that's just the basic idea. Okay, so let's say that your aim is really good, that you can shoot these little paintballs through this barrier with a slit and you're able to hit this white screen on the other side. Now, how is the white screen going to look like? Well, we know that we're de dealing with matter, so we could treat these paintballs as particles. How is the white screen going to look after you shoot several blue balls through the slit? Well, it's just going to look like this. You're going to have a nice line of uh, blue paintballs on the white screen. Now what happens when you have two slits in the barrier? Your aim is still the same. We're still working with the blue paintballs. How's the white screen going to look? Well now you're going to have two lines of, of uh, blue paintballs on that white screen.
let's change it up now to light waves. We have a wave. It encounters a barrier with a slit. What do you think the white screen is going to look like? Well, the, uh, the waves are going to diffract. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bend so that it could go through the slit. And when it hits the screen, we're going to have a nice bright spot. What happens to the waves now when we have a barrier with two slits? Well, if you said two bright spots, you are incorrect because you forgot about the diffraction pattern, the interference pattern from earlier in the video. Um, so now, here, when, when the waves go through these two slits, it's almost like having two new sources of waves. And those sources of wave, like those waves that are coming from uh, the slits, they are now going to interfere with each other. We're going to have an um, alternation between constructive and destructive interference, and that's what this interference pattern is. Mm -hmm. Remember, you, you'll only see this pattern if waves are involved and they're interfering with each other. Okay, so now let's scale this down to electrons. We're now shooting electrons um, through the slit. Now, we can think of electrons as particles because we know that they have mass. We were saying before in the Rutherford nuclear model that um, most of the mass in the atom is found in the nucleus with the protons and neutrons, the mass of the electrons are, are so much lighter compared to uh, the other two, compared to the protons and neutrons. Okay, so electrons have mass. We're going to say that they're going to act like particles. So what's going to happen, uh, like what are we going to see uh, on the white screen when we shoot electrons through the slit? Okay, it's, it's going to be similar to um, the paintball gun. Okay, we're going to have a, a spot like right in the middle. Okay, now what if we have two slits instead of one? How would the screen look now? Ah, now we have a diffraction pattern. We said before that we're treating the electron as a particle because it has mass. But we already know that diffraction patterns, interference patterns, only occur if our source acts as a wave. So OK, maybe the electrons that are coming out of this gun are uh, acting like waves. OK. So then. What happens if we just shoot one electron at a time? Or let's just say we're, we're just going to shoot one electron and see uh, what happens after it goes through one of the slits. What do you think the white barrier, oh, sorry, the, the white screen is going to look like? Okay, we still have a diffraction pattern. How does that make any sense? Is, is the electron interfering with itself? Well, that's what some scientists think. They believe that this electron, as it moves closer and closer to the barrier, it's going to split up into two electrons, go through both slits at the same time, and then interfere with itself to get this interference pattern. Well, OK. How about now we take a look at it, uh, but open up the box. Okay, so we're still shooting just one electron from our electron gun, but this time we are going to observe it. We are opening up the box. We're going to see exactly 
which slit this one electron is going to go through and form the diffraction pattern. Okay, so now, now we come up with something different. This, this is like Schrodinger's cat. Us observing which uh, slit the electron is going through is us opening up the box to see if the cat is alive or dead. Okay, so because we are observing, that's the only change here, because we are observing what's happening, we come up with a different result. So we can never see, we can never see both the interference pattern and simultaneously determine which slit the electron goes through. The interference part, that's the wave portion. Determining which slit the electron goes through, that's like the particle nature of the electron. Uh, the next couple of images are the ones that are found in your textbook. So uh, the idea is the same uh, compared to the last several slides that I showed you. Uh, when electrons are uh, sent through these two slits, they're going to act like waves and uh, produce an interference pattern on the other side of the barrier. Scientists thought that they would see bright spots on the other side because they believed that the electrons would act like particles, since electrons have mass. So because of the uh, electron slit experiment from before, we're going to take a look at the effects of those um, of that experiment. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the de Broglie wavelength. Okay, Louis de Broglie said that all particles, electrons, you, me, the humpback whale, we all have wave-like characteristics. This is significant for electrons because they are so small, because their mass is so small. So this is the equation for the de Broglie wavelength. We have Planck's constant. We have mass. This V is a real V. It stands for velocity. Okay. Uh, if you multiply mass and velocity together, uh, you're going to get momentum. Okay, so that's what de Broglie is saying here. The wavelength of a particle is inversely proportional to its momentum. Now, why is it that macroscopic particles, objects, don't seem to have any wave-like characteristics? Well, that's because we are just so big. We, our mass is so big that our de Broglie wavelength is extremely small. So for us to observe any de Broglie wavelength, the mass of that object is going to have to be extremely small. Also, the velocity would have to be small because again, um, these, two, these two variables are inversely proportional to the de Broglie wavelength. So let's do a few calculations with our uh, new equation. Calculate the wavelength of an electron traveling with a speed of 2.65 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. Okay, so it's uh, really important to note that our mass is given in kilograms. Okay, we write out our givens. We need to figure out wavelength. Okay, so that's where we'd need the de Broglie uh, wavelength equation. So you have to remember that in Planck's constant, we have joules, so joules times seconds. When you break down the joule, you have one kilogram times meter squared over second squared. So if you're given a mass that's not in kilograms, you're gonna have to convert. That's what a lot of students miss. Okay, so when uh, all our values have the proper units, then we could start crossing things out, okay? And then what we're left with is uh, meters, 
when you punch everything into the calculator correctly, uh, we would have a de Broglie wavelength of 2.74 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Okay, here's another one. Uh, the wording might be a little bit tricky, but you're still using the same equation. What's the velocity of an electron that has a de Broglie wavelength? Approximately the length of a chemical bond. And they give you the length as 1.20 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So press pause, uh, use the de Broglie equation, and when you're ready for the calculations and the answer, click play. Okay, so uh, we're um, rearranging the variables here so that we could solve for velocity. Uh, don't forget the value of Planck's constants. Okay, um, our mass is in the correct unit, so uh, we're just going to plug in the numbers into the equation. So our answer here should be 6.06 .06 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Let's take a look at our next question. Um, quantum mechanical theory is universal. It applies to all objects regardless of size. So according to the de Broglie relation, a thrown baseball should also exhibit wave properties. Why don't we observe such properties at the ballpark? Okay, so uh, press pause read through the three choices, see which one makes sense. So you're just basically finding the true statement here and uh, press play when you're ready for the answer. Okay, so the answer is A. Uh, if you weren't too sure about letter A, uh, let, let's, let's take a look at the other two choices. Since baseballs do not have any charge, quantum mechanics does not apply to them. Um, I, yeah, the de Broglie wavelength doesn't say anything about charge, so I would just cross out B, um, bec because of, uh, because of this word here. Uh, letter C, quantum mechanics does not apply to baseballs. Okay, well, you know, in the problem, they already said that it applies to all objects. So, uh, since B and C uh, are false, uh, letter A must be true. Um, and if you remember the de Broglie wavelength equation, you'll know that mass and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. So letter A is just a rewording of that, but applied to a baseball. Okay, so the de Broglie uh, wavelength is uh, one aspect of the electron's wave nature. Here is another one, the uncertainty principle. Okay, so here, uh, this is where we're going to see how the wave nature of an object and the particle nature of an object are complementary characteristics. With complementary properties, we're gonna have to look back at the electron slit experiment. Okay, so um, at one point we saw electrons acting as waves because we observed an interference pattern on the white sheet. Once we tried to observe which slit the electron went through, then we were trying to understand the particle nature of the electron. So wave, waves and particles are complementary properties. The more you know about one property, the less you know about the other. So again, once we had that camcorder, that, that video camera to observe which slit the electron went through, we started to know more about the particle nature. But then what happened to the interference pattern? It disappeared then we knew nothing about the wave nature of the electron. 
this is where the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes in. This is our equation. Uh, you need to know this equation, uh, but you're, you're not going to be using it to actually solve for anything. You just have to know that when you multiply the uncertainty of the position, so the delta x is, is for the particle nature, the m delta v is for the wave nature of an object. Okay, when you multiply these values together, uh, they are at best going to equal a constant. Okay, um, so if, if this doesn't make sense, let's just break it down a little bit. X uh, means position. So, so when you think of a particle, think of something that's just fixed in space. Okay, it's not moving. Now with a wave, a wave doesn't stay in one position, it propagates, it oscillates through space. So if it's moving, it's got to have some speed, right? So, so that's, where, that's where this m delta v comes in. This is the wave portion of an object, okay? So the more you know about a, a, an object's momentum, then the less you know about its position. Okay, if you know that something is moving, well, that means that it's not fixed in one position. Okay, the less you know about one thing, the more you know about the other thing. Uh, this question here is, is um, basically asking you to find the true statement which one best summarizes the uncertainty principle. So please pause this, read through your choices very carefully so that you understand what they're saying. Uh, when you're ready uh, for the answer and the explanation, click play. So we said before that we can't know 100% the position of an object and 100% the velocity of an object at the same time. There's no way for us to figure that out. If we know more of the position, then the less we know about its velocity. Okay, so letter A should be, um, should be crossed out right away. Okay, letter C, that, that one is false. That one is incorrect because you can know the position of an object very accurately. It's just that you can't know the position very accurately and the velocity very accurately at the same time. So our answer is letter B. It's either you know the position really well or you know the velocity really well. Okay, it's either one or the other. So we took a look at the de Broglie wavelength took a look at the uncertainty principle. Now we need to look at indeterminacy. So with classical physics, uh, there was no randomness. If we go back to the first slide with that equation, if x is equal to 3, then you know for sure y is going to equal 7. But because of um, the uncertainty principle, we can't be uh, absolutely accurate of the position and velocity of an electron at the same time. So because of that, we can only really guess. We can only predict where these electrons will be um, around the nucleus. Okay, so instead of fixed orbits around the nucleus, we're going to be looking at orbitals. Now picture yourself throwing a ball to your buddy on the other side of the field. With classical physics, this is the trajectory that the ball is going to take. But with the quantum mechanical model, again, you're not going to know the position very accurately and the velocity very accurately of an object at the same time. 
So we're going to have what's called a probability distribution map. The ball could be down here. It could be up here. It could be out here, but it's very unlikely. Okay. You could also see that it does kind of form of an um, form an arc. Like the middle of this distribution map is uh, a little bit darker than the rest of it. So where is this ball uh, most likely to travel? In the middle of this distribution map. Okay. So instead of throwing around a baseball, how can we figure out where an electron is located in an atom? Well, we're going to need to take a look at that electron's energy because energy and position are related to each other. If we know the energy of an electron, then we can figure out that probability map that shows where we can best find that electron around the nucleus. For us to figure out where these electrons are located, we would need Schrodinger's equation. Now, you, you don't have to memorize this. You just need to know that it exists and that it's needed for us to figure out where electrons are located based on the energy of that electron. Okay, so now um, solutions to this equation are uh, represented by this Greek letter called psi, P-S-I. Now, if we square uh, these solutions and plot it on a Cartesian plane, then we're going to have an orbital. We're going to have a 3D representation of where these electrons are located. So here's our orbital, specifically called the 1s orbital. It's the simplest one that you're going to encounter. There are many different types. Um, you can see our three different axes, x, y, z, where the axes intersect. You could think that the uh, nucleus is found here in the middle. Uh, so you could see that just based on the distribution of dots, uh, you're most likely going to find the electron very close to the nucleus in this orbital. Okay, so as you move further and further away, the less likely you're going to find that electron. Here's another way of looking at it, but it's the same idea. Um, as R increases, then the distance from the nucleus increases. So we can see that most likely we're going to find electrons very close to the nucleus. Now we're going to look at the solutions to uh, Schrodinger's equation. Uh, there are four quantum numbers that you need to know, but you have to understand that these first three, N, L, and M, L, they come straight from the Schrodinger equation. Okay, and these three determine uh, the size, shape, and orientation of an orbital. This last one here, MS, you're going to see this in the next chapter. Uh, it's not part of the Schrodinger equation. You, you must remember that. But in, in the next chapter, you'll see that all four quantum numbers are needed to describe an orbital in an atom. Okay. Um, also, uh, there are certain rules that you have to follow when determining these three values, N, L, and ML. There are certain rules that you have to follow. Also, when you're listing the four quantum numbers, you have to list them in this exact order. First number is always N, then it is L, then ML, and then MS. So the first quantum number is N. That's our principal quantum number. And that shows the energy of an electron. It shows the energy. 
energy level or shell. There are a lot of different ways to depict this letter N. Okay, now the rules. N can be any integer. It can be any whole number greater than or equal to one. So when you're trying to figure out uh, the, um, the N quantum number, you could start off with one and just, just keep going technically, but you're always starting off at one. Okay, uh, the larger the N value, the more energy the orbital has. Okay, um, you're gonna see a version of this equation uh, later on, but you could see that as N increases, as N increases, the energy will become less and less negative. So as the energy level gets higher and higher, eventually the electron will reach an energy of zero. And when it does, it basically escaped from the atom. Okay, this is a very nice picture of the different principal uh, energy, energy levels in hydrogen specifically. Here you could see that the energy levels are not evenly spaced out. There's a huge gap between n equals 2 and n equals 1. You should also notice that as uh, the energy levels increase, the spaces between um, energy levels are getting smaller and smaller. So if we had an electron that started off at n equals four and jumped down to three, well, it's gonna release just a tiny amount of energy compared to an electron jumping from two down to one. This space is uh, much larger compared to, uh, to four and three so that means that the radiation that's going to be released between 1 and 2 is going to be higher in energy. Uh, also notice as we increase in N, uh, take a look at the energy levels, it's getting less and less negative. Once E equals to zero, then you can say that the electron escaped the atom. The next quantum number is L, and that represents angular momentum. So here you are determining the shape of an orbital. Okay, you're determining the shape of an orbital. Um, another way to um, describe this number is subshell or sublevel. Now for the rules. L can be um, an integer. It can have integer values from zero to n minus one. So this is what I mean uh, when I said that these quantum numbers have to be written in order. You cannot determine the value of L if you don't know what n is. Okay, so let's just say that n is equal to 2. Our possible integer values for L would be 0 and 1. Okay, we have to stop at n minus 1. If n was equal to 4, then our possible L values would be 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's it. Okay, so our n value determines our l value. Okay, now just to make things a little bit more confusing, we're not going to use numbers to figure out l. Well, I mean, yeah, we will, but to, to designate l, we have to use letters. Okay, so you're going to have to memorize these letters, s, p, d, and f and also how these orbitals will look like. The whole point of these letter designations is so that you don't get confused with the numerical number of N, the first quantum number. Okay, so if our value for L is zero, 
then that means S. One would be P and so on and so forth. Okay, so here are different examples of uh, various orbitals, okay? So you are, you've already seen one S before. Okay, so here we go, one S. This tells me that N is equal to one and L is equal to zero because I see the letter S here. Okay, and any um, S orbital is always going to have a spherical shape. With this P orbital, I know that the L value is equal to 1. The L value is equal to 1. And all the P orbitals are going to have um, this bilobed uh, balloon shape. Okay, the same thing can be said with the D orbital. L is equal to 2, and then F, L is equal to 3. Later on um, in this video, you'll see the other orientations for D and F. So let's try this question out. What values of L are possible for N equals 3? Pause this. Take a look back at uh, the rules, figure out what the choice is, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is letter C. We always, for, for values of L, we always have to start at zero and keep going until we reach N minus one. Since N equals three, we have to stop at two. So letter C is the only one that makes sense. Okay, if N was equal to four, which answer choice would you pick? Hopefully you picked letter D. Because again, you stop at N minus one. If, if uh, N is equal to four, then we have to stop at three. The third quantum number is ML, and that tells us the orientation of an orbital in 3D space. The rule that you have to follow in figuring out ML values is to list all the integers starting from minus L to plus L, but you also have to include zero in your list. So here in this example, if we say that L is equal to two, then our possible ML values are negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two. And because we have five values here for ML, that tells us that there are five different orientations for the D orbitals. And this is how the five D orbitals would look like. Uh, note the subscripts in these labels. So for D, Y, Z, that just tells you that the four lobes are in the Z, Y, or Y, Z plane. If you take a look at D, X squared, Y squared, well, pretend that these four lobes are being skewered by the x-axis and the y-axis. Okay, so we just looked at this example. So let's see how well we do here. What values of ML are possible for L equaling two? So pause the video, make your list, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. So remember the rule in figuring out ML values. We have to know what our L value is in the first place. Then we're gonna list our integers starting with negative L, going out to positive L, but we have to include zero in our list. So the only uh, answer choice that works out here is letter D. Once you have your three quantum numbers, 
then you have enough information to describe one single orbital. Now when you read your textbook, uh, there might be synonyms or other phrases in describing these quantum numbers. Uh, it's your responsibility to know these synonyms, so make sure that you have a running list there. Okay, so with um, the n quantum number, I might have been saying energy or energy level. Um, another way of saying it is principal energy level or principal shell. Okay, for the L quantum number, there we could say sub level or sub shell. This is a very good picture showing you the different levels, sub levels, and orbitals. Okay, they're nicely clustered together. Okay, um, I like to tell my students if you take a look at each row, so we have three rows here, if you take a look at each row, uh, they represent energy levels. If you take a look at colored blocks, so we have gray, we have two blues and three reds, those represent sublevels or subshells. So when n equals three, we have three sublevels. These white boxes that are inside the colored boxes, they represent the orbitals. So those are your ML values. Okay, and note how they're labeled. Okay, we got our um, negative numbers listed first, moving all the way up to our positive values. Okay, that's just the convention of, of labeling these orbitals. Okay, so um, with enough practice, if I ask you how many 3D orbitals are there, you would automatically say five because D represents L2, L equaling two. And if I want orbitals, I need to know what the ML values are. So if L is equal to 2, then I have 5 ML values, starting with negative 2, going on to positive 2. This is a much more simplified way in uh, showing the energy levels, sublevels, and orbitals. Most likely, you'll be drawing these out instead of uh, the picture in the previous slide, uh, but this still works just as well. So here you could see for, for 1s, this is our sub-level or sub-shell containing one orbital. So instead of a white box, we have black lines. Here for 2p, this is our 2p sub-level containing three orbitals. And the same thing goes with 3d. We have five orbitals in this one subshell. These are very good shortcuts to know um, if you're ever asked how many sublevels there are or orbitals. Uh, you just have to be careful with the information that's given to you. So if you take a look at the second bullet point here, uh, showing you how to figure out the number of orbitals within a sublevel. Well, that, that's where you have to pick your colored block and then count to the number of orbitals. So going back to, to 3D, 3D, our L is equal to 2. So that's the value that we're going to put in our little equation here. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5, and that's where we get our 5 boxes, our 5 orbitals. Okay, um, with the number of orbitals in a level, so in a row, you're going to have to take the n value and square that. So in this, ca in this case, n is equal to 3. So we have 9 orbitals. We have 9 white boxes. If for some reason you can't remember these shortcuts, it it's perfectly fine. If it's, I don't know, for me, I would like to just draw them out and 
count that way instead of memorizing something that I'll probably mess up. This is just a basic review of the first three quantum numbers. Remember, there are four, but we're only focusing on the first three because they're derived from the Schrodinger's equation. Okay, you're only dealing with integers here. They can be positive, uh, negative. Uh, don't forget to include zero in, in your lists. To go from one quantum number to the next, you're going to need to know the value of the previous number, except for n. Okay. Um, with this picture here, again, each row represents an energy level. That's your n. Each colored block tells you the shape. They would be the subshell or the sublevel. The little white boxes, those are your orbitals, are your ML values, and they give you the orientation of the orbital. Let's do a little exercise here in figuring out quantum numbers based on the n values that are given to you. So here we have n equals 1. Based on the rules, what are the L and ML values if n equals 1? Please press pause, figure it out by yourself, and when you're ready for the answers, press play. Okay, so for L, L is equal to 0. Remember the rule here. For um, listing possible L values, you start off with 0 and you end with n minus 1. Well, 1 minus 1 is 0, so our only answer here is 0. Okay, so now ML, our answer here is also 0. We need to go from negative L to positive L, and we have to include zero in our list. Well, there's no such thing as negative zero and positive zero. So these are our three quantum numbers. These are numbers when n is equal to one. Now what happens when n is equal to three? What possible L values would we have if n equals three? Go ahead and pause. Write out your list, and when you're ready, click play. Okay, so we started off with zero. We are going to list our integers until we hit n minus one. So in this case, it's two. We end at two. So our possible L values are zero, one, and two. Now, we can't just list ML values now. We can't just list them. We have to designate what our L value is. Okay, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to list zero because we've already seen it here. If L equals zero, then ML equals to zero. So now what happens if L is equal to one? What possible ML values would we have? Again, press pause. Work it out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, again, we have to go from negative L to positive L, including zero. So we have negative one, zero, positive one as our ML values. Now what if I say, all right, instead of one, I'm, I'm picking two instead for L. What are our possible ML values now? Well, now we're going from negative 2 to positive 2. We're going from negative 2 to positive 2. So again, this shows you that in order to move on to the next quantum number, you need to know the value of the previous number. Okay, so we can have many different combinations here. It's just that they all have to make sense. Okay, so for, for set A, that was our first example here. The rest of the sets come from 
our, our second example with n equals 3. Okay, you could see that all of these combinations make sense. Like we can't have, like for set E, um, if n is equal to uh, 3, l is equal to 2, well, ml cannot equal negative 3. It's just not part of the list. Okay, so here uh, you're being asked to write out the quantum numbers and the names of orbitals in the n equals 4 principal level. Then you're asked how many uh, orbitals are there in the n equals 4 level. Okay, so at this point we should know our rules already. If n equals 4, then our L values would be 0, 1, 2, and 3. We're going to need the letter designations in order to name those orbitals. Okay, and then to figure out the number of orbitals, we're going to use our shortcut n squared. Here we go. Here uh, is our answer in a nice chart. Okay, we have our L values and then possible ML values based on L. In order for us to name an orbital, we're going to need the n value, which is going to be our number part, and then the L value, that's our letter. Okay, and uh, the total number of orbitals in n equals 4, that'll be 16, 4, four squared. Uh, again, if you can't remember any of the shortcuts, then write it out, draw it out like this, and then count how many orbitals there are, and you should still come up with 16. Okay, this one's a, a little bit different, but the process is pretty much the same. I'll list the quantum numbers associated with all of the 5D orbitals and how many 5D orbitals exist. So this one is a little bit more specific. This one's a little bit more specific. So uh, make your list, uh, press pause, make your list, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so these are the sets of quantum numbers uh, for the 5D orbitals. Okay, we should only have five because that's what that's what uh, that's how many D orbitals there are. Um, so, yeah, the five portion here in the name represents our n value. Uh, the L represents D, so that's that's our number two for L. And then we have to write our different ML values based on L. Okay, now how many 5D orbitals exist? Well, there are five. We have five sets of quantum numbers that represent 5D. So there are 5D orbitals. So uh, this is what I'm saying when um, uh, the question is being more specific. In the last question, it asks how many orbitals are there in n equals 4. Well, that's what you're going to have to square 4. Here, they're being more specific with the orbitals. Um, so if you wanted to answer 25, 5 squared, then this question should have said how many orbitals exist in n equals 5. So you needed to have a, a broader question being asked. Okay, so I like these types of questions better because this question would definitely show your understanding of quantum numbers. So here we have four sets of quantum numbers that specify an orbital. So we have n, l, and ml. We need those three. One of these sets is wrong. Figure out which one is wrong, why it's wrong, and how you can fix it. So press pause, take a look through, 
When you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is D. This is, this is the wrong set. So we start off with n equals 4. We're good there. If we do that, our possible L values are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So th that works out. We have L equals 1 here in set D. So we're picking um, 1 as L. So our possible ML values can only be negative 1, 0, and positive 1. Okay, so our ML value here does not work out. How can we fix this set so that it makes sense? Well, um, we could change L to 2 or even 3. Or we could change ML to negative 1, 0, positive 1. And then that set would be correct. Okay, so here in this one, all three sets are incorrect. You need to figure out how to change one of the numbers in each set so that overall they are correct. Uh, so please, please press pause and when you're ready for the answers, click play. Okay, so for letter A, we could do uh, one of two things. You, you might come up with uh, something else because um, I, I may have missed one or a few. Letter B, we could change ML to negative 1. And letter C, we could change N or L so that it could so that it can make sense. So remember that psi squared is probability density, or in other words, an orbital. So with an S orbital, you should picture something that's spherical. It's 3D and you're most likely going to find an electron closer to the nucleus. So as you move further and further away from the nucleus, the less likely you are to find an electron. Now in the next couple of slides, you're going to see nodes in those orbitals. Now think back when we were talking about um, interference and um, destructive interference. A node is where nothing happens. If we were going to give it a numerical value, we'd give it a zero. So if you see a node in an orbital, that tells you that there is zero prob probability of finding an electron in that space. You've seen this probability density graph before. It tells you the total probability of finding an electron in that orbital. Now with this graph, the radial distribution function, we are going to look at a specific distance from the nucleus. So here we're still looking at the 1s orbital. We're still looking at a sphere. Here it's telling us where are we going to find an electron? Most likely at 52.9 picometers away from the nucleus. Here you could see as n increases for the s orbital, the number of nodes also increase. So here we have uh, the 2s orbital. Uh, you could see two areas where you're more likely to find electrons. Uh, this white space here in between the two blue areas, that would be a node. You are not going to find electrons in the node. And then moving on to 3s, the orbital is a little bit bigger because we have an extra energy level added onto it. We also have another node. So just generally speaking, the s orbital is going to be spherical. The ml value will always be zero. 
The number of nodes, though, you'd need uh, n minus 1 to figure out how many nodes there are. So for the 1s orbital, there are zero nodes. In the previous slide, we already saw that the 2s orbital would have one node and the 3s orbital would have two nodes. With p orbitals, you're only going to see them in um, the second energy level or higher. Uh, you could see that, oh, there we go. You could see that there are three different values for ML because of the three different orientations of the p orbitals. Uh, please remember that they are two-lobed, and there's already there's already one node at the nucleus. So instead of n minus 1 in figuring out the number of nodes, it's just n. Here are the three different p orbitals oriented along the three different axes. So if you see px, you know that uh, the two lobes are uh, situated along the x-axis. Also, you could see there is a node where the nucleus is located. So as you go higher and higher in the energy levels, you're, you're still going to increase in the number of nodes, but it'll just be n instead of n minus 1, like with the s orbitals. You've seen uh, these five values for ML already when you were first introduced to the uh, third quantum number, ML. Again, there are five different orientations. Uh, one of them looks a little bit different, and I'll show you that again in the next slide. Here you could see that four of the orientations have four lobes. It's like four balloons. This one right here, dz squared. It almost looks like a p orbital with a hula hoop. Finally, with the f orbitals, there are seven different orientations for these orbitals. Uh, these uh, shapes are more complicated. You actually don't need to know how these look. Uh, for the most part, you, you do need to know the s orbital, the p orbitals. Uh, the d orbitals you're going to see in chemistry 104. Here are the seven different f orbitals. Even the designations for them look uh, extremely complicated. Uh, again, you don't need to know how these look. You don't need to know the subscripts. But for sure, you need to know and memorize the s orbital and the p orbitals. So imagine you're a balloon artist, and you have to tie all these balloons together so that they're connected in the center. This is why atoms are spherical. They're all connected because of the nucleus in the center of that atom. You're going to learn more of orbital phases later on. Um, it, the idea is very similar to constructive interference and destructive interference. Uh, except this time we're going to consider signs, so positive and negative. If they're the same sign, then the orbitals will be in phase with each other. If they're opposite in sign, then they're going to be out of phase with each other. In this last bit, we're going to look at atomic spectra and specifically how electrons can jump from one energy level to another. So in order for an electron to become excited, it has to absorb energy. It has to absorb a photon so that it can go from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. When that electron relaxes, then it's going to release energy. It's going to release some radiation and move from a higher energy level to a lower energy level.
Now you'd have to think back to the photoelectric effect. That wavelength of light has to be the correct wavelength or reach a, a threshold frequency in order for electrons to absorb those photons and um, escape from the electron. This is the same idea here. Uh, you can't give me 28 quarters for that bottle of water. I'm going to need a $7 bill so that we can complete our transaction. Okay, so once those electrons absorb the correct uh, photon size or a photon with the correct amount of energy, then it's going to jump up to a higher energy level. Now remember in chapter six, if there's something that has high potential energy, that object is going to be extremely unstable. So these electrons in high energy states, they're going to want to lose their energy and be in a more stable state. And as they lose energy, the radiation that's going to be released is going to correlate to the distance between the two energy levels. Here we have an example of an electron starting off at n equals 1, and it jumps up to n equals 3. It absorbed enough energy, it absorbed a photon to let it jump to energy levels. Now again, this energy level is way too high, it's very unstable, so the electron is going to relax down to a lower level. It doesn't have to go back down to one. It just has to go back to a, a lower level. And in doing so, radiation is going to be released. Now, the type of radiation is going to depend on the difference in energy levels. So let's just say that um, the light that was released was red light. OK, if the electron relaxed down to the first energy level, well now more energy was released. Now we could say, all right, the color of light that was released was violet because it has more energy compared to the red light. Now you saw in the previous example that excited electron in the third energy level can um, relax down either to the second level or to the first level. So it had two choices there. So when figuring out how many lines or uh, how many wavelengths are going to be produced, we have to look at the energy state in which the electron is located and then apply n minus 1 to figure out how many lines would be generated. So we need to look at the difference in energy between the two levels if we want to figure out the energy of the photon that's being released. So here's our uh, one of our equations, delta E atom. So we need to look at the energy states in the final state and in the initial states. We could take this equation here and just simplify it a bit. Again, it's final minus initial, but we're multiplying by a constant. One thing to note here is that when you're dealing with emission, you have to change the sign of the delta E atom. Why? Because the energy of a photon is always positive. So you have to be very careful when you're reading a word problem that deals with um, changes in energy states. If you're looking at absorption, if an electron is absorbing energy, then you don't change any sign. It's only when a photon is being emitted, then you have to change the sign so that the energy of the photon is positive. This is a very nice picture of the different uh, jumps that electrons can take and their corresponding radiation emissions. 
So if we take a look here with ultraviolet light, you could see that there are a lot of different jumps and they're, they're big jumps too. Um, if we start off at n equals five, there are four possible lines, four possible wavelengths that can be emitted. So that goes back uh, a, couple of a couple of slides ago. Five can jump down to four or to three or to two or to one. Those were our four choices there. Okay, now let's compare that to the infrared light that's being emitted. We could see that the distances between um, n equals five to n equals three and even four to three, their distances are much smaller. So less energy is being transferred. If we have a small amount of energy, then we're going to have a longer wavelength. That's why infrared light is being emitted in this part of the picture. Okay, so you could uh, answer this question two different ways. You could either look back at the previous slide and take a look at that picture very carefully, or you could actually do the work using the equation that we just saw. So which transition emits light with the shortest wavelength? Go ahead and pause, think about it, figure it out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. So our answer here is letter C, going from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. All three of these choices are emission because you're starting off with a higher energy level going down to a lower energy level. Now, also, just a tip, um, I would suggest writing out all the relationships between wavelength, frequency, and energy. Here it's saying that um, light is being emitted with the shortest wavelength. So what does that mean in terms of frequency and energy? Well, if you're looking at something with a very short wavelength, then you're looking at something that has high frequency and also high energy. So with these transitions, we need to find something that had a big jump. And letter C is the one that has the biggest jump going from n equals 3 to n equals 2. Okay, so let's use the equation and, and do some math here. Determine the wavelength of light emitted when an electron in a hydrogen atom makes a transition from an orbital in n equals 6 to n equals 5. Okay, so we need to find wavelength. You have to remember that the energy of the photon always needs to be positive. And we have emission here. We have emission. We're going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. We need to figure out the delta E for the atom. And because we're dealing with emission, we have to negate our answer so that the energy of the photon stays positive. Okay, so here's the work. Um, again, oh, if, if this looks too complicated for you, then just jump right into the second line of calculation. It's, it's the same thing. Okay, final minus initial, but it's multiplied by some, some factor. Uh, my suggestion to you is be very care careful with parentheses in punching these numbers into the calculator. The math may look very easy, but you, you have to be careful because, I mean, obviously we have um, the inverse of the energy level. So 1 over 25 minus 1 over 36. Again, we're dealing with emission, so we have to negate our previous answer to get a positive value for our energy of the photon. And then we use the energy equation with Planck's constant to figure out 
the wavelength. All the proper units cancel out. We're left with meters, but we can convert it to nanometers. So that's 7,460 nanometers. So try this one out. It's the same idea. Determine the wavelength of the light absorbed when an electron in a hydrogen atom makes a transition from an orbital in which n equals 2 to an orbital in which n equals 7. Please pause the video, work out the math yourself. When you're ready to take a look at the work and the answer, press play. Okay, so again, we're using final minus initial, the final energy level minus initial energy level, but squared, and we're multiplying it by negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Again, be very careful with your parentheses when you're punching this into the calculator. Okay, so here, the delta E of the atom is the same for the photon because light is being absorbed here. So we're not changing any signs. Light is being absorbed. So the last thing that you need to do is use the energy equation with Planck's constant to figure out the wavelength. And we have 397 nanometers. Here's the last problem in our set. Oh, we have an electron in n equals 6, and it relaxes to a lower energy level. Light is emitted with a wavelength of 93.8 nanometers. Find the principal level to which the electron is relaxed. So you are trying to find n final. You're trying to find n final. Okay, please press pause, work this out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so we're going to need the energy of a photon. We're essentially working backwards here, so we need the energy of the photon. We're going to use our equation with Planck's constant. So here we have 2.11. 92 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Because we're dealing with emission, because we're dealing with emission, the, um, the electron relaxes to a lower energy level. Because we're dealing with emission, we have to negate our previous answer. So we have to use the negative 2.1192 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, we're going to use the equation uh, for delta E atom involving final minus initial. We are trying to find n final. Okay, it cannot be 1 over n final. It cannot be 1 over n final squared. It just has to be regular n final. Okay, let's start plugging everything in. We have our delta E atom from before. Our initial energy level was 6. Here we simplified uh, our equation a bit. Okay, and then we added 1 over 36 to both sides, so we just have 1 over n final squared on one side. Okay, now this might seem confusing, but what we did here is we took the reciprocal. This is 1 over n final squared. The reciprocal of that is just n final squared. Um, with the other side, the, the left-hand side, 0 0.999883, taking the reciprocal of that is, is like saying 1 over 0 0.999883 and then pressing 
um, equal to or enter on your calculator. And you're going to see that it's just one. This is not our final answer. This is n final squared. We just want n final. So now we got to take the square root of, uh, of both sides. So if we take the square root, it's just going to be n final on one side and one on the other side. So our final answer here is one.